So uh, hello, everyone. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a good time to start. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Rishi Goyal, Director of the Medical Humanities major and the co-organizer of this series, Medical Humanities and Pandemic Urbanisms, at the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. We are delighted to welcome you back to our series, marking the new undergraduate major in Medical Humanities here at Columbia. Many thanks to all those who've returned and also to new viewers. We are so glad to have you with us as we continue our series. This event was rescheduled in support of the graduate workers' strike. With over 560,000 deaths in the United States and more than 3 million deaths worldwide, the pandemic offers a grim, but unfortunately timely backdrop to launch our new major in medical humanities. And I say timely specifically because our speaker today, whose work has also been described as timely, asks in another context, is work that stretches back years and years and considers the toxic milieu of race, capitalism, imperialism, disease, and immigration really ever timely. Tonight's panel is an exploration of Anjali Raza Kolb's timely first book, Epidemic Empire, Colonialism, Contagion, and Terror, 1817 to 2020. It builds on the themes of our series' first two panels, the long history of anti-Chinese animus in relationship to pandemics, and the problems of institutional racism and memory in medicine. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Department of English and Comparative Literature here at Columbia. Our moderator is Professor Stathis Grigoris, Professor of Classics and English and Comparative Literature, and he will begin by introducing our panelists. Welcome, Stathis. Uh, thank you, Rishi. Um, it is my pleasure to be chairing this uh, this panel, uh, which is uh, in the series uh, Medical Humanities and Pandemic Urbanisms. Uh, the panel is, is titled uh, Epidem Epidemic Empire, Colonialism, Contagion and Terror, 1817 to 2020. Uh, and it is based on uh, the book of our uh, guest, uh, Anjuli Raza Kolb. Uh, who is Associate Professor of English at the University of Toronto, where she teaches post-colonial literature and theory and poetry. Uh, her academic research explores how science, medicine, natural history, and other sorts of uh, colonial knowing reshape literature, culture, economy, and politics. Uh, her book, uh, uh, Epidemic Empire, which is published by University of Chicago Press, uh, uncovers the history behind the dead metaphor of the, uh, quote, terrorism epidemic, by looking at documents of public health, policy, immigration, law, novels, poems, films, and, and et cetera. She's also a poet, uh, and her poems, translations, and other essays have appeared in various venues and are in conversations, in conversation, sorry, with the traditions of Urdu poetry, contemporary queer poetics, and uh, lyric memoir. I, my colleague, uh, my, uh, my colleague Liz, uh, um, Liz Povinelli is a critical theorist and filmmaker and of course, professor of anthropology here at Columbia. Her critical writing is focused on developing uh, a critical theory of late set settler liberalism that would support an anthropology of the otherwise. Uh, this uh, potential theory has unfolded across five books, numerous essays and 35 years of collaboration with her indigenous colleagues in North Australia, including most recently six films that have created that have uh, that they have created as members of the carbing film collective uh, her book geontologies a requiem to late liberalism was the 2017 recipient of the lionel trilling book award and the cunning of recognition was an art forum best book of the year uh, carbing films uh, who have received also major awards uh, including the 2015 visible award and the 2015 15 cinema nova award for best short uh, fiction film um, in uh, Melbourne International Film Festival and have been shown internationally in, in all kinds of venues, uh, well-known venues like the Berlinale, Berlinale Forum, uh, the Sydney uh, Biennale, uh, the Tate Modern, Documenta 14, uh, etc. So I welcome uh, Anjuli and, and, and Liz Povinelli to our panel. Thank you so much, Stathos. Um, and many thanks in particular to Rishi Goyle for the invitation to share my work with you today, as well as Sarah Monks for coordinating log logistics. I'm excited to be with you all wherever you are, and I'm grateful to write, work, and live on Lenape land in the historically Black neighborhood of Harlem that I've been lucky to call home for 22 years. 
We postponed this event, I want to note, to honor the graduates' workers' strike for fair working conditions, and I'm incredibly proud as a former striker and supporter of this union and workers everywhere to see the provisional contract is in place as of last night. I'm especially excited to be talking tonight with Beth, who is one of my total all-time big intellectual heroes. I'm looking forward to thoughts and questions from the audience as well, because nearly everyone has had to become expert in the cultural and material aspects of living through an epidemic this year. I too am still learning so much about what I was studying for the years during which I was making this book. As a last word of welcome, I want to pause and honor the intersecting griefs we're carrying today. The murders of our brothers and sisters in Atlanta, in Indianapolis, the murder of George Floyd, Duante Wright, Adam Toledo. A verdict like the one we heard today does not, to borrow a phrase from a conversation with a loved one earlier today, alter our path even if it alters our strategy. Thank you for being here. If you wanna take off and join our communities in the streets, please do, and we will catch up later. If you're in Harlem, I just got back from the walk that started on Old Broadway and 125th by the 26th precinct and is headed east on 125th Street. And if I get updates as to where they are later, I will tell you. I said I would talk about the book and so I will in the hopes that that is useful. Um, Rishi, can you give me a nod if the audio is still okay? I think I just heard something. We're okay? Okay. In Epidemic Empire, Colonialism, Contagion, and Terror, 1817 to 2020, I study the overlapping discursive, literary, political, and medical histories that have made the notion of an epidemic of terrorism a defining strain of common sense in the 21st century. I've come to think of the work I'm doing in the book as a deep dive into a shallow metaphor. This phrase and its metaphorical elaborations have defined contemporary Islamophobia. Islam and Islamism are a cancer on the human condition, a plague on reason and progress, embedded and insidious retroviruses, ideological contagions. Although I began the book long before the COVID-19 pandemic, our moment has had no shortage of intersections with the research I did. In addition to the nightmarish spike in hate crimes against Asian Americans, much like the hate crimes against those perceived to be Muslim in the years after 9-11, the virus was immediately associated with indiscriminate Asian-ness, and those who appeared to be other in the European and North American context have suffered grave harm as scapegoats for the kind of thinking drummed up by villainous world leaders. A year ago at the start of the outbreak, Anticipating a dramatic wave of infections during Ramzan and following Eid al-Fitr, the Western media wondered whether Muslim gatherings would become super spreader events, and mosques in Salt Lake City and Missouri were vandalized and burned in apparent hate crimes. The same politicians who called for essential workers and the elderly to martyr themselves to the economy had pathologized Muslim martyrdom just years before. The conceptual and moral incoherence is staggering. Viral epidemic and pandemic figures typically work in literature, historiography, and politics to maintain a clash of civilizations thesis of the type popularized by Samuel Huntington in his 1996 book of the same name. In my own archive, I look at how commentators on the Algerian Revolution, the Indian Mutiny of 1857, the conflict in Kashmir, the Iranian Revolution, and the current global migration crisis, for example, reach for the forceful image of Islamist and terrorist epidemics in order to shore up a notion of the healthy civilizations of the global north, while at the same time constructing the global south, post-colonial states, and the quote-unquote Muslim world, terms that are used in strategically imprecise ways, as zones of rampant infection, roiling virality and raging epidemic, poised to break out at any moment and fell the global order. Disease in this imaginary is conjured as an analog for rebellious, mutinous, insurgent or irregular violence. Categories outside of a concept of just war that create a foundation for theories and legal definitions of terrorism as a particularly virulent species of non-state or anti-state violence. In this framework, all acts of war and neo-imperial expansion and soft annexation are recoded as acts somehow of care. I write about how the casual language and official justifications of neo-imperialism, especially European and US American, begin in the wake of the September 11th attacks to adopt the figure of epidemic, not just as a ready metaphor, but also as a disciplinary key to thinking global terror. The United States Institute for Peace, for example, suggested in a 2005 briefing that, quote, this is sort of a longish quote, 
Given the dynamic, unpredictable nature of Islamist militancy, we are drawn to an epidemic conception as a way of thinking and acting in response to this threat. This approach draws on the scientific principles and practices of epidemiology, as well as insights from a growing body of research on social contagion phenomena, such as fads, rumors, and civil violence. Indeed, social scientists increasingly look to epidemiology to understand a variety of contagions, and here, Islamist militancy is no different. It too can be deconstructed using the classic epidemic model, end quote. For other policy experts and government agencies, including the Department of Homeland Security, epidemiology becomes a productive method in the 21st century for analyzing, combating, and securitizing a phenomenon that is understood to be virulent, shapeless, and evasive, but that nevertheless remains the object of an endless war. This is not the medical humanities we need. As Gayatri Spivak noted in her 2004 Terror, A Speech After 9-11, an essay I like very much, quote, in the policymaking arena, terror as social movement and terror as affect come together to provide a plausible field for group psychological speculation. The social movement is declared to have a psychological identity. In other words, making terror or civil, both civil and natural provides a rationale for exercising psychological diagnostics, the most malign ingredient of racism. The epidemiology of terrorism was for a long time a burgeoning subfield, not just in social science, but also as an inflection in the law. The possibility of a not yet existing epidemic, it should be noted, was used by Justice John Roberts to defend the Muslim ban in 2018, calling up memories of the panicked and discriminatory response of the US Congress, not just in the deep past of the Asian exclusion laws, but also as recently as 2010, when the ban on non-US citizens who were HIV positive or suffering from AIDS was finally lifted after 22 years. My research in literature, colonial medical and military history, demographic and administrative reports, and official counterinsurgency documents tracks how these figures come to be so strongly associated with the non-West, with brown and black people, with failed states, and with the so-called problem of Islam in contemporary geopolitics. I built on my teachers and foreparents in post-colonial criticism, particularly a minor but crucial point in the great subalternist historian Ranajit Guha's essay, The Prose of Counterinsurgency where he observes the tendency in the colonial record toward depicting peasant insurrections as natural phenomena. They break out, he observes, like thunderstorms, heave like earthquakes, spread like wildfires, and though he doesn't return to consider the figure further, they quote, infect like epidemics. In other words, he writes, when the proverbial clod of earth turns, this is a matter to be explained in terms of natural history. A persistent feature in, in colonial historiography, the strategy not only dehumanizes agents of historical change, it also excludes nonlinear models of history as irrational and, in fact, ahistorical. I'm particularly in mind here of Beth's corrective to the often inaccurately reproduced stagism of Foucault's paradigms of power. It is not just the naturalization or the organicization of history set against but also seeking to incorporate Spivak's notion of the civic and the psychological that is at stake in this figure. The very concept of the epidemic and its methods of study are wedded to colonial history and epistemology, specifically to the study of history and study of cholera, the first global epidemic. In telling this mutually reinforcing histories of terrorism and epidemic, I reach back to the foundations of colonial discourse to its administrators and recorders of history who favor a disease poetics of empire. The celebrated British Indian historian, JWK, for example, who pronounced in 1850 during a hugely lethal worldwide cholera outbreak that there is, quote, nothing more contagious than rebellion. But I also look to its novelists and lyric observers. As most students of colonial literature know, Rudyard Kipling's infamous lyric, The White Man's Burden, urges the moral colonialist to take up his duties to civilize and enlighten the irrational children of the hotter climates, but also to fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. Tasks, he asserts, that come with neither glory nor reward. My work in Epidemic Empire interrogates how this admonishment to care in the context of comparative imperialisms is neither an accident nor a rhetorical infelicity. It establishes and constantly reinforces a sense of the colonized and the underdeveloped world as both sick and the source of sickness. Empire's disease poetics, and I mean this both in the self-evident way, 
the metaphorics of disease in empire, but also as a poesis or a making, the way empire creates itself and defines its borders through the management of disease, shapes colonial history and historiography, and solidifies the intractable association between race, violence, and epidemic. In so doing, the epidemic thesis produces an inhuman or natural enemy in order to obscure and invalidate the political demands, uh, obscure or invalidate political demands, and to justify global security apparatus in defense of a humanity, a category that is constituted by its exclusion of phenomena perceived as contagious, like terror, like Islam, like non-white people. As we have learned or relearned over the last months, even epidemics are not natural. in the sense that their courses are shaped profoundly by human interaction and human behavior. The COVID-19 pandemic has been exactly as cruel as we allowed it to be. What I offer in this book is the background that helps explain the epidemic injustices of our present moment, racial, imperial, capitalist, and scientific, and reorient us toward a more just future. In the era of Trump, we have needed to say, listen to the science, but this too is a necessarily complex task. A brief overview of the book. In the first chapters of Epidemic Empire, I show how these figures of disease have become easy analogies for both terrorism and Islam because of how Britain imagined and wrote the two greatest threats to its empire in the 19th century, the Asiatic cholera outbreaks and the Indian mutiny of 1857. The, the chiastic historical and literary record consolidates each of these events in the image of the other, such that the mutiny becomes legible as a contagion originating with the Muslim troops and the native army, while the cholera outbreaks are imagined as the very land's rebellion, a vengeful and murderous assault on Hastings army, the apparatus of trade, and by extension, the entire liberal economy and colonial system. The Asiatic cholera epidemics understood to travel west by way of the vast numbers of Indian pilgrims performing Hajj over land and by sea, corollarily imagines South Asian Muslims as mobile vectors, not just of pestilence, but also of disaffection, anti-colonial sentiment, and new and powerful nationalisms. I read Kipling's novel Kim as a blueprint for the assassination of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan in 2011, an archive of 19th century color writing and early epidemiological texts, and Bram Stoker's novel of the shifting borders of the Orient, Dracula. So the first three chapters deal with the 19th century record of disease and rebellion in the British Empire, largely in India, but also extended to the more proximate colonial zones of Ireland and poor and working class England, which were disproportionately affected by the cholera epidemics and later the famine. In the second part of the book, I show how these associations are taken up and reassorted during the Algerian independence movement, drawing on both British and French colonial discourses of medicine, political theory, and the ongoing construction of Islam and Muslim peoples as a global plague. My key texts here are Camus' journalistic writings on Algeria and his epidemic novel, The Plague, the torture memoir of Algerian freedom fighter, Jamila Bupasha, Gio Ponte Corvo's indelible The Battle of Algiers, famously screened at the Pentagon at the start of the, of the War on Terror, and the Algerian medical writings of Franz Fanon. In the book's final part, I read the language of late 20th and early 21st century Islamophobia across a suite of works by Salman Rushdie, as well as the 9-11 Commission report, the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture, and Solma Sharif's poems in her documentary collection, Look, where the speaker or speakers incorporate, inhabit, and transform military terminology from the Department of Defense Dictionary. In addition to the dehumanizing effects of imperial disease poetics, the practices of quarantine, the policing of sanitary borders, national and international vaccination programs, conflicting immunities, and a terror of global pandemic have tended to serve protectionist and West-centric interests. They have also, as we have seen over the last year, utterly failed to cognize the actual threat of pandemics, as if the West and the global North were in some kind of alternate timeline from the rest of the world. The events in the US Capitol on January 6, 2021 have brought me back to some of my earliest questions about epidemics and insurgency. Today, we are not talking about a figural overlap. As in the late 1850s in India, we are talking about an acute and actual intertwining of pandemic and insurrection, one anti-colonial and one white supremacist. It's worth thinking more about what the shared condition of vulnerability brought on by a pandemic enables in terms of collective thinking and what it enables in terms of reconceptualizing who counts as the body politic. Racist white Americans have reacted violently to understanding themselves as existing in the same space, pandemic space, if you will, as the rest of us. It is inconceivable to them. 
anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, pandemic deniers are saying many things. But one of the things they are saying is, I refuse the pan or the universality of this condition. It doesn't apply to me. My body, white America's body, is not vulnerable. It is immured, immune. It doesn't need to hide behind a mask. To some extent, they are right. The medical racism in this country, to give a very complex set of factors a short name, has made, as you well know, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people leagues more vulnerable to COVID-19 and to the amplification of long COVID symptoms. The breach of the Capitol was a ritualized performance of the immunity to police and the sovereignty feet on Pelosi's desk, the seizing of the rostrum of the white, able, cis, hetero body. What I'm trying to say is that the questions of the book, I think, are very much with us today, and I'm sad to realize that they will be for some time. I'm going to end with a few thoughts from this week, from what I've been reading and fretting about, namely the intersection of the planned 20th anniversary withdrawal from Afghanistan on September 11th, 2021, and the, and the unending incidents of police brutality against Black and brown people in American cities. These are both functions of the normativization of white legal and cultural immunity. The war on terror has fueled not just the underlying racism of American police forces, but has quite literally armed the domestic war on Black, Brown, Indigenous, and Asian people. In an interview yesterday, veteran Adrian Bonenberger, who did two, or two tours in Afghanistan, reminds us of the hundreds of administrative decisions umbrellaed under the Pentagon's 1033 program that are bringing these weapons home. This is a quote from the Bonenberger interview from yesterday. I didn't realize at the time, but it was a $50 billion expedited program to swap out every up-armored Humvee with mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles. What they didn't know when we got the MRAPs was that here we are on the border of Pakistan with a bunch of roads that we built that barely support Humvees. There was a fill that collapsed because we were driving over in a vehicle that weighed about 40,000 pounds. The Humvee weighed 20,000 pounds. We blamed the Afghan contractors, contractor at the time. It sounds psychotic, but we were like, oh yeah, the Afghans built this substandard road. It's their fault. That felt so emblematic. It feels to me today so emblematic. We only had those MRAPs in service for five years. We spent 50 million bucks for a five-year rental and then sold them to police stations across America. Those MRAPs that did fuck all for us in Afghanistan are now what the police are using presumably for their small towns. On Sunday, a CNN reporter bemoaned the detaining of a credentialed journalist, an Asian American producer, Carolyn Sung, who was asked by the arresting officer if she spoke English in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Sung was there to cover the protests against the killing of Duante Wright and the gatherings in anticipation of the end of the Chauvin trial by saying he had never seen a reporter treated so poorly outside of Afghanistan. I'm thinking about Jody Bird today in the transit of empire regarding the uses of the Modoc Indian prisoners legal opinion of 1873, which made it possible for Indians to be killed without being murdered. Bird writes, quote, citizens of American Indian nations became in this moment the origin of the stateless terrorist combatants within US enunciations of sovereignty, end quote. As many of us remember from last summer, as we prepare for this summer, as we remember more deeply from past seasons of protest in 1999, 2001, 2003, 2014, 2017, this designation has long gone hand in hand with the insurgent aesthetics of the viral. I'm hoping at this moment that we can repurpose the durability and plasticity of the metaphor to affiliative ends. And I'm going to stop there and I look forward to discussion. Great. Uh, uh, thank you, Anjali. Uh, this was lovely. Uh, Beth, um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you um, for that wonderful opening um, on a, a good but terrible day, obviously. Um, and I would also like to say that those who want to protest rather than listen to me should go and do that. Um, the helicopters are out. I'm not sure if you hear them over there. Um, but I want to, I want to, I really do want to celebrate this book and congratulations. Um, there's so much to speak about um, in relation to its ambition. Um, uh, the first is simply the amazing archive that you dug, dug into. And for those who have not yet read it, 
Um, it is a thick, thick investigation of a set of territorialized, though connected, archives and literatures uh, that Anjali brilliantly interprets in order to investigate what she calls the shallow metaphor of the figure of the Islamic terror, Islamic pestilence, and Islamic madness, right? So the, the way in which, um, and I, I love that metaphor, the shallow nature of the metaphor, which we can really talk about, like how do we think about something so persistent, um, mm -hmm. so uh, geographically extensive, and yet also shallow, right? I think that's something we really have to think about. You know, I was, as I was reading the book, um, I thought of three, I have so many things we could talk about. I thought of three broad um, areas that I would love to talk with you about and hear you speak more about. One, of course, is, is the framing of all our work under perhaps the, the central rubric of uh, colonialism and the empires it spawned. Um, and thus even the virus, and here we could say COVID, um, is underneath that rubric. And of course, all of us who are writing books that are coming out now um, will have, as yours does in a very moving way, a preface part of its introduction, um, stating that they're written under these very particular conditions, conditions both of the, the quote, emergence of COVID, but also in the ongoingness of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and so how do we think and frame our work within those, at least those two contexts? Um, so for me, your book was really uh, brilliant in looking both at the virus as a metaphor with this shallow but deep and geographically extensive um, um, power, but also as an index, right, of colonialism. That is, the virus, COVID-19, may be a metaphor for many, many things, but is itself a yet another example of certain kinds of bodily effects that emerge out of and has to be have to be understood in relation to the long history of colonialism and and here for me um, there there I've been thinking about um, two broad ways in which um, both. Uh, uh, viruses, um, uh, climate collapse, uh, the toxicity of, of extractive and uh, consumer capitalism are, are framed in one is uh, avenir or coming, that is it's coming on the horizon, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's something that's arriving. And then another way, which I believe your book is doing as well, importantly, that is this is an ancestral catastrophe, an ancestral event. And thus we have to understand things like COVID and other forms of ghoul health as a culmination of this, as a cumulative and still distributed effect of all this. So that, that's one thing I thought it would be really great to talk about that is just to dig into the virus both as a metaphor and the way you're thinking about its use in the figure of Islamic terror and pestilence and madness, but also it as the material culminations of the a disavowal machine yep. of colonialism and the empires it spawned. Okay, so that's that's one big, big one, right? The second thing I thought would be really super interesting to talk about was, of course, your methodology, which is, you know, in the broad sense, an archaeology of the present. And, you know, I love the prose of counterinsurgency. I teach that in almost any every course I teach. Um, no matter what the course is, I just teach it, right? <laughs> um, and, and of course, for me, the and from Guha to Spivak, the argument about whether or not one can um, um, extract the voice of uprising mm -hmm. 
from the secondary and tertiary forms of capture, you know, in terms of uh, intextualizations. And so, you know, Guha is very much, we can, but then he takes the reading of of the uprising or the counterinsurgency as a mass contagion and turns it into a rational political project, right? And so his way of dealing with contagion, this, 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 as you so wonderfully show in the book, this, this, this reading of certain kind of bodies in protest as uh, suffering from contagion, spreading contagion, and he rationalizes it. And so, and then, and, and Gautry says, no, A, you can't do the project. And B, perhaps that contagion is that, that violent shuttling. I'm not sure, but it's like, it's, it's something that I think is really super cool. One of the things that I'm interested in is how do we think about the pros of counterinsurgency relative to the pros of decolonization and perhaps relative to the pros of of movements against uh, white supremacy and for Black Lives Matter, right? And this takes me to the third, which is again, just really, I'm just curious what, how you think, which is, you know, we're in this really great, terrible moment, but it's it's great moment um, in which we have powerful, powerful voices and theorists who are trying to to rethink, we could say, insurgencies or survivances or um, insistences across the, the terrains of the disavowal machine of colonialism. And those terrains um, emerge from the Black Atlantic. They emerge from um, first nations, uh, Native American, indigenous people, and they also emerge from a specifically black feminist account of sexuality and gender and oppression in the US. And they don't always account for where we need to go in the same way, in, in part because they're also giving a different situated account of what is needed. And here I think of like Paul Gilroy's anger at, at Haraway, for saying what we all need to do is become a critter. And Paul Gilroy is saying, you know, we weren't even allowed to be a human. Um, we're trying to become a different kind of, uh, find a different, reground the human outside of this virulent Western epistemology of humanism. And there, and in that joining with Sylvia Winter and other trying to create a different kind of human. Um, but folks like Zoe Todd, Glenn Colthard, um, Kim Tolbert and others um, saying that that you know for them what's needed is is a a reinvestment in relation between themselves and their more than human world. That is, for them, there's no problem in being a critter because it, although they were treated as subhuman, the, their mode of relating to the more than human world, is for them the way of survivance against the kind of gene ontological imaginary. And then with black feminism, moving from someone like Hortense Spillers to Cydia Hartman, a whole different kind of um, uh, understanding of what we need to do. And all of them are related to each other. One is not the right one and one's, that's not the right way to go. It's they're all expressing the complex terrains. And I, I just thought a book like yours in which you're looking not only at a deep archive, though a shallow metaphor, but across these terrains from, from South Asia to North Africa to the US, you know, hearing you speak on like the, the how to think these metaphors of epidemic um, as providing a ground for multiple refusals of the colonial history. But so, so I think maybe, I mean, that's a lot, obviously. Um, and partly I just wanted to start by asking a really simple question, like what was the most surprising thing you found when you dug into all these archives? Like, what did you suddenly think? Oh, I thought X, but now I think Y. You know what I mean? Like, whoa, that threw me. 
Um, so any, any of that is really anything you want to jump on. And I know it's a lot and I, 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 I want to talk about work. all of it. <laughs> don't, <laughs> it's a beautiful um, don't make me laugh too much or my mouth will hurt. Oh, right, right, right. No joke. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think the thing that keeps on kind of detonating as a kind of ongoing surprise mm-hmm. is, is and no, no surprise. <laughs> I've just dropped my pen. Um, I'd have to retrieve it at some point. Um, if you keep asking such complicated questions, I will definitely have to retrieve it. Um, so, (laughs) so I think, I think the thing that's, that's an ongoing surprise, um, I've been talking about a fair amount, the last couple of, uh, book talks I've given, which is how, um, like you described it as a territorialized, uh, but as a series of territorialized, but also connected archives and, and forever, partly because I, in some ways came to the idea for this book by thinking through um, accounts of immunological genocide in the new world right. Um, right. Is, the, is, the, is the profound connection uh, between early US imperialism um, and, and immunological genocide against indigenous people and the archive that I'm looking at. I think that, for a, I think that as I was writing the book, which is already too long, mm-hmm. um, for practical purposes, I kept thinking this is a parallel story, um, and it's and and other people have done it better. I was rereading Jody Bird this morning, as I said. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's stuff. Um, you, you've done it better in a different in a different context, and I, I kind of just thought like that's you know, not. We all have to do it. That's all. It yeah. yeah. So I was so now I think there needs to be a fourth part of the book that's about mm. very direct connections um, between military method. Mm. Um, and uh, and epidemiological study um, mm. a- as it plays out in the war on terror, as it was learned from um, this uh, this moment in, in U.S. expansion, territorial expansion, and um, murder. So that I think that has been a surprise, both in the in the you know finalizing the manuscript, but then also in continuing to learn about the book in the in the year since I sent it off to the press. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some fun there you know there were some fun surprises. Like it turns out I really love reading like incorrect 19th century doctors. Um, they're they're tender scientists, like they're beautiful mm-hmm. writers, yeah. some of them. And um, I loved being in that archive. That was a bit of a bit of a surprise. Um, I didn't know quite how much I um, hated later Rushdie, you know, these are like, these are things that emerge as you, I was like, I think he's was not good. <laughs> and then by the end, I was like, oh, I really, I have, um, a lot of rage. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe the other thing to say for people who are specifically in the audience for this talk, um, is how, is how hard it was actually, um, this seems impossible in 2021. Um, but before 2021, it was pretty difficult to get anyone to care about this medical history in relationship to post-colonialism and post-colonial theory, which is so weird. It's so weird to say that now, mm-hmm. but I had a ton of trouble pitching the book, um, finding like the correct field to look for a job in. Like it was, it was, um, I don't know. It was, it was really, really surprising to me actually, because the work seemed pretty like like straightforward actually in what it was doing. But it kind of, it brings me to a question that you asked um, under the auspices of the third kind of circle, which is about how, like I share, I wanna say I share this impatience of Gilroy's um, and- Sure, we all do, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is like part of what feels like a method a really, really central method of black feminism, particularly that I'm continuing to try to learn from is, is the poetic as a method. Um, Like I, I continued, and it's, I think it's the thing that continues to link me to the literary, not just because it's um, a, an avenue for thinking about how small ideas become common sense, but I do think that's important. Like that's why I read famous novels and it's why I think about books that circulate and movies that circulate. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I'm never not going back to Audre Lorde. I'm never not thinking about um, the actual like necessity of poetry for life. Um, and and if those are if those are kind of my starting points in terms of a method, I think what I want to say about all the various political elaborations, anti-colonial, decolonial, um, post-colonial, uh, black radical, um, 
non-state uh, insurgencies, what they can share via the poetic for me is like a not already knowing the full yeah, length of the true. manifesto. Um, and so- yeah, You know, Vine Deloria, I mean, that no, that's really, because Vine Deloria in um, God is Red, uh, made an intervention that I think as a rule of thumb is just brilliant and super important. And that is, you know, he, for him, and he's really talking about the white Christian God, right? And he talks about two different forms of revelation. And the first form of revelation, he, you know, he says, you know, white, white, white revelation, which by it mean, he means that glissant Christian era like nomadic conquering route. And he says the way, I, I'm paraphrasing, but um, the way revelation works for that thing is that some um, uh, uh, transcendental entity whispers in someone's ear a truth that extends to all of existence and therefore yeah. must be given to all of existence. And in that mode of revelation, it's a no, it's an arrow like, you know, conquering mode of revelation. And he said, and again, you can say, well, you know, this is too bold, but as a rule of thumb, it's great. And he said, for native people, revelation doesn't function as that. Rather, you come to understand uh, a, a new form of how you're related to others, including humans and the more than human world here-ish, you know, how I would say here-ish. And it opens a conversation in other places with how they might be related differently given this, but it is not a conquering revelation. It is not true once and for all and, and everywhere. And yeah. one of the things that I, I think is so interesting and I'm just super looking forward to how the conversation moves and, and, and changes and vaginates and grows is, is let's put Haraway on the other one hand, like on this side and say, okay, yeah, you know, this, this kind of manifesto in which we all become creators. So let's not have a one at all, but, but rather a conversation between someone like Paul and someone like Zoe Todd or Kim Tolbert in which these are understood as revelations in the non conquering era like no matter form. That is their revelations like, well, here we think a refounding or a continuing of a form of human with the more than human world would be interesting with Paul, your rethinking of Césaire's, this, the two Césaire's working out of transhumanism around the kind of Black Atlantic. And so it's a it's an opening to conversation rather than say an answer. And I think that's what I hear. The second thing I would say, what you said, which is super interesting is the, the problem with you finding a placement for the book. Um, and I would say, you know, it's really, it's super interesting because on the one hand, it's like shocking. On the other hand, it's like, oh yeah, because I like why? Because what you're doing is so important. You're saying there's a phrase I pulled out, and it's I, I'm getting you wrong, so you can fix me exactly what you say. But it's you say epidemiology's methods and motive methods, motives, and practices are well suited for postcolonial and globalization critique because epidemiology emerged from the ameliorative from ameliorative settler colonialism. And I just was like, wow, check. And for me, what that meant was, and here's a real reduction of your thought, it was you created these disease pandemics in, as you, as those ships sailed across the Atlantic and the Pacific and then you abjected disease onto others, yep. right? Um, and so it's, and as you, and you abjected it onto others, you had to come up with a science that 
that did the same thing. It studied the other as if the plague was coming from them, although it arrived on your ships, and we all know that. And and with the, and I think you see it really. I would have loved that fourth section, but that's too long. Because with with the South Asian example you used, you know that going west. If you guys haven't read yeah. this, it's amazing. It's like oh my god, like cholera's going west, right? The cloud. You know that's part of that weird um, um, uh, disavowal that starts in the colonial ships, right? It's so it's so stark. I mean, it, and yeah. especially it was stark with the way that um, the Trumpian discourse was unfolding. Mm. But like, mm. just for those of you who haven't read this part of the book, what Beth is talking about is the way that, like, in the in the eighteen thirties and eighteen fifties outbreaks of cholera. Um, the, the British press was obsessed with the tendency of the disease to travel from east to west. Mm. Meanwhile, it was just as much going east, right? <laughs> like, yeah, that's right. Of course it was. Yeah. Um, because, you know, because those colonial trade routes were global. Yeah. I mean, it, this brings me back to the first thing that you were raising, which is about like, how can something be so shallow, so persistent, and so oh. almost universal? I mean, that's what happens when you build an aqueous extractive economy, it's literally at the surface. <laughs> like it doesn't have to go deep. It's just ballasted a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it, and it moves, it moves freely through space as if space is only a thing to be navigated and negotiated. Right. Um, and so of course those, those trade networks are the networks of disease. Yeah. Um, that's how think, I mean, that's how the potato blight also came from, um, from, bat guano, right? A literal deterrestrialization of earth in the form of fertilizer um, being brought back to, um, uh, to Europe. Uh, and so I think, you know, I was thinking actually about your example of like Brussels being like Congo being in Brussels and, and we, I mean, whatever we, I don't want to go on about this forever because we know it. I mean, we all know it. It's something that a bunch of like virus nerds knew for a long time. Um, but now every single person, um, who, who picks up a newspaper knows about it too. Mm -hmm. Stuff isn't where we say it is like the globe is everywhere. The U S empire is everywhere. Um, and, and that's because of trade networks. Yeah. But, you know, it, but again, it's, uh, I absolutely agree. Right. Um, uh, the globe is everywhere and and the 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 virus hitches a ride yeah right? and we, we yeah and and everybody now knows that um like we knew the we knew all kinds of things hitch were hitching rides in those super tankers and then being disemboweled at state ports right so the big container ships the floating disease vectors that we called um, carnival cruises. Oh, and God. remember Diamond I Princess? <laughs> I know. Remember? Oh Lord, they're gonna come back. Um, but what was I gonna say? Oh, but what's also important for me at least is, and I, I think you do this really well, is that we we don't flatten the forms that those arrivals had to take as they encountered specific human and more than human mm -hmm. refusals or, right? So, so it's one of the reasons why, you know, early on I was like, well, I don't believe in, I'm not one of those people that defines liberalism or defines settler colonialism and then looks to see if something fits it, but instead tries to think of it as a citational form or a di diasporic form. So, so yeah. when, yeah, and I, I, the, one of the reasons why it's important for me um, um, is that it creates these um, uh, uh, frontiers um, and interiors to colonialism or settler liberalism, right? Whatever we can call it, different things. Um, in the, its very attempt to smooth out space for its own good, right? So it attempts to smooth out space in a way that, that creates a specific direction of accumulation 
and spoilage. But in doing that, it actually constantly contorts itself. And it does so legally, it does so geographically, it does so my dog is knocking on the door. <laughs> Hi, Ida. Um, so I guess that's also part of why I was thinking about three with you because you've been working in these archives in these different spaces. Like if you look at Australia, the way, by the time the British got to Australia, they thought they had learned a lesson about negotiating treaties. So they said, no negotiate, like treat everyone fine, but don't negotiate treaties, just declare terra nullius, right? They also discovered a place that didn't, that geographically didn't like, you know, it's like, we don't, where are the rivers, right? To the, the grand reeds. Um, and so new forms of property emerged that then created new forms of protest and refusal from um, indigenous people in various places. So that, the, you see what I mean? So how do we not flatten and homogenize space in ways that um, uh, reinforce hmm. liberal accounts of an already you know, dominated space? We you must have seen differences. I mean, you're in North Africa, in Algeria, you're over in South Asia, you're, you're in the US. I mean, the particular ways in which these, these um, epidemic discourses form matter, right? They do matter. And the fights, I mean, there were fights well, there are a few things I want to say because, and one is, I'm, I'll try to answer the question, but one is just like where my mind is going as you're, as you're asking this. Um, I mean, there were, there were fights. Part of what I'm trying to say is that medicine was always political. So the resistances were not, um, the, the resistances were not, you know, so binary in the sense that it wasn't like, um, a population that was being having this horrible thing visited on it and then that, those forms of resistance like there were also epistemic forms of resistance that had to do with um, things that were inconvenient for empire um, and things that you know what a, a kind of talk about smoothing over a, a, a set of like really knock down drag out fights about about what causes diseases to move and spread prior to contagion theory being sort of, you know, I, I mean, the debates I would say are probably as as um, violent as like the climate change debates in some senses. Uh, and and so the, there came a point at which there was no longer a way to pretend that um, uh, the movement of bodies was what was causing harm. But of course, the resistances that were encountered to this um, habit of figuration were different in each place. In, right. in the South Asian like 19th century context, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't in my reading anyway, um, a real desire to adopt the figure of the virus or the contagion as a revolutionary one. By the time you get to North Africa yeah. in, um, the, in the 19, bit, late 1940s and 1950s, there was an awesome and totally cool sense um, that there was a way to take the virus figure and like turn it into a kind of, um, what do you call those things from like a sports team, like a mascot? Um, oh, I was about to say, don't ask me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the baseball, the, yeah, the no, racket. The, um, the, yeah. yeah, to like turn it almost into a, into a mascot. And we saw this again, I mean, we of course saw this again in, in um, early AIDS discourse, like, a, a, a real um, repurposing of the name, right? Like taking back the, um, the yeah. There's an example, the literary example that's in the book is the way that um, that a kind of political, a, a pan racial political movement comes together in London, in Thatcherite London in the 1980s, under the auspices in the satanic verses of what's called tropicalization, um, as a kind of revenge, um, a revenge moment. So I think that the I think that um, with regard to the figure, um, the way that the way that anti-colonial subjects have sort of played with um, the worst insult that can be thrown at them, the, those versions of dehumanization has obviously shifted from, from period to period. And I would say like the veil um, in that, uh, both in the Battle of Algiers and in Fanon's essay on the veil in the Algerian context and in, in all of the other, um, especially visual depictions, mm -hmm. the signification shifts from week to week 
Mm -hmm. right? I mean, these are strategies. Mm -hmm. And I think this gets me back to the question you were asking earlier about like, because really I think, and I appreciate this so much about your work too, like there's, there's nothing, there's no moment at which what we do next as political beings is more than half a step behind the work that we're making. And so I kind of like, in a way, of course, I care about the archive that I was looking at, but I really love this question. Like, what the fuck do we do with these movements and the way that we have understood? I mean, there's the slow work of understanding through the archive. Why is it that our struggle, Asian American struggle has been held apart from black struggle in the U S yeah. like, what are the smoothings that produce the right. separation of those resistances? That's good history work. That's archive work, but that's also marching work. Okay. Um, and that's community meeting work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess, I guess the I guess the like gymnasticism of re- resistance movements and the constant adaptability of resistance movements um, is is one of the ways that I keep up hope about this stuff because because the ossification of a, of a of a resistance is what kind of kills it. Mm. Um, so that constant mobility, I think, it does it, it's necessary both as movements come into contact with each other, but it's also, as you've been saying, and as you've been writing about so beautifully, it's also necessary as movements come into contact with the more than human um, or the dynamism of the earth or the way that the climate is collapsing around us. Um, Mm. So there's a kind of, yeah, just mobility or agility that's necessary there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And one of the things that really was, was interesting to me is, is is in these moments how and again I, I i was just interested to hear you talk about this how um different kinds of figures can become uh sites of identification like my my dog is squeaking <laughs> <laughs> my dog is not squeaking but my dog loves these nasty yellow ducks and they have squeakers in them <laughs> Anyways, this is interspecies and, communication. I can't believe how mean you're being about it. <laughs> I don't even. Um, but when I was when I was thinking about uh, you know John Topower, and I was thinking God, what 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 is this moment? Um, and this is prior to COVID, obviously. What is this moment um, uh, uh, in, in in the in the midst? of these heated debates about, I would say climate toxicity, climate collapse, climate toxicity. Um, uh, Because if we say climate toxicity, we're getting to the relationship between climate and capitalism. That is, right, anyways. Um, And, you know, I was thinking through what what has always been um, within um, or animating biopower and blah, blah. And so I was talking about John Topower. And then I was thinking that like, we see now three figures really consolidating as, um, as a response to the, the, what seemed to be a new form of power to the West, but it was a very old form that had been mobilizing everywhere. And of course it was the desert and the animus and the virus. So I was saying, you know, the desert tries to solve the problem by saying there is a difference between life and non-life. And the animus tries to solve the problem by saying, don't worry, everything is lively, which is a no solved problem. It's kind of like recognition, liberal recognition. And then there was a virus, which um, um, was, is a, I was saying, this was like in the early 2000s and which, which solves the problem by saying, I don't really care. I'm just going to take it. And in, in some ways, this was, you know, I was in the beginning, it was first I was like the desert, the animus and the terrorist. And then I said the desert, the animus and the Islamic. And then I was like the desert, and like the virus, because the virus, I thought with when I'm reading your book is the virus is Islam. The virus is the terrorist. Pestilence is blah, blah. Just the shallow metaphor just goes round and round. And what I found really interesting at that moment was the way in which everybody like the animism, not actual animus, but animism as a figure. Like there was, there was a thing, but everybody quickly ran away. Everyone wanted, the coolest kids want to be the virus. Right, and the arts, <laughs> incredible, eerie, 
you know, it was like, oh, I vote for the virus. And I was like, no, no, you don't want to vote for a virus because to be a virus is to be the object of intense scrutiny and annihilation. Someone has made you this and now they're going to destroy you. And this is your book, right? Yeah. I mean, now and they're going to destroy you. Capitalism has made this and now it's going to try and absolutely destroy it. And they have to keep making it. Right. And it's and if you're in the vicinity of the virus, I said, you you yourself, a real virus, you yourself will want to kill it. Yeah, you you flee if you're in the vicinity of the virus. In fact, yeah, the, I think I mean, I, I've, I've been thinking about your con the, about your concept of the virus and what its undecidability like what, like what is so threatening about its undecidability as a figure? As a figure. And I've, a, I've, I've been thinking a couple of things. First, I am not into and nor will I ever be public. I'm into making jokes publicly on Twitter, but I'm not into like policing other people's use of virus metaphors, although I pay a lot of attention to them. Oh, um, but I'm really interested in what you think about- Me? The no, it's all on you. <laughs> no, I actually really want to know what you think about the proliferation of uh, clever reversals, like the real virus is racism. The real uh, virus is the police. Right, right. The real virus is, because I, yeah, I, right, right. I'm I, with that spirit, right? Like, I mean, I know where that comes from and yeah, I'm yeah, totally on that team, but I'm also really curious about that under, like, Yes, when you're in the vicinity of the virus, as you say, you, it, you you're all your it's like a video game. Like you're just trying to pew, 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 get rid of it. But there's something behind that too that interests me also, which is the un, it's like the fact that the virus is, and I think this comes to problems of the postcolonial subject, by which I mean like the ontological subject, um, and especially the Muslim subject as like a bombed out or black box impenetrable, like you can't find it, um, you can't find its reason. This kind of goes back to your question about Guha's rationalization thesis. Yeah. Um, but the thing about the virus is that it won't decide if it's alive or not, or we can't decide if we're if it's alive or not. So it's this limb figure. And, and really, before we get to the point, like the entire logic that spins out from the virus is one of prophylaxis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though we're horrible at it. It's not like there it is, let's kill it. Right. The logic that creates the global security apparatus is let's not even let it exist. Right. So That's right. I had this perverse thought the other day that it's actually a kind of, um, it's actually like the terror of a kind of pro-choice logic um, that animates okay, this like okay, weird okay, sense that. that we need to prevent. <laughs> You're like, That's, I'm not going there with you. Um, Oh, I see what you're doing. You know, it's really, I, I would just, I would just. Or a eugenicist. Let me just say that. That's easier. Eugenicist. You, you, what did you say? Or a eugenicist. Yes. That's a bit, a bit, a bit clearer. You know, like, I don't. Like, even I, I don't prevent practice. Muslims from coming into being. What that would be ideal. Although. Although settler colonialism needed the virus. And in Australia, it. it right. And it actually intentionally used it as I'm sure it did in the US and I'm sure it probably did in everywhere. That is, it intentionally infected blankets that were distributed in order to kill people. So it was also a, uh, I'm not sure if, if you think about the security state and the, you know, the, the, military apparatus, they're actively making viruses. So that's part of the weaponry. But but that said, but that said, you know, my little, so so I was really, it's like yours, yours is the first book that I've read. I'm sure it's not the only one and it definitely won't be the only one because what I'm gonna say, but here's the first one I read in which it began, I was writing this during, in the I was finishing in the middle of COVID. And I thought, wow, me too, that's exactly how I'm writing the same thing because the guy in ground is going to come out in the fall and I'm finishing it up there. And in relation to the, your, what we're just talking about now, for me, what was important was to remember that COVID was not 
our friend or our enemy. And this, this was something that came to be said by a lot of people, which is great. Because in the beginning, as everyone can remember, the war metaphors against COVID were thick and fast. I was yes. just like, oh my God, if I have to hear Cuomo or anybody else say how we're planting a flag on a mountain, you know, to defeat the worst enemy. And this reminds me of war. COVID was, is not our friend. Uh, sorry, COVID's not our enemy, but it is also not our friend. That is, it's not within a friend enemy logic. It's not within the structure of the political as understood out of the long um, epistemology of, of political theory, say, vis-a-vis -vis Schmidt, all right? And, and, and the virus is not necessarily biopolitical. The, for me, the, the virus is more geontological in the sense that it emerges. And again, I think your book is, a, is, is an example of this, but I don't want to absorb it, um, of the, the disregard um, of that which lies outside of life, the, the hierarchization of life. So you got the white on the top and then you have, you know, black, brown and indigenous bodies and a hierarchy relative to the distance between the, the West's account of its own like geist unfolding bullshit. And, but the total disregard of, of uh, the, the more than human and indeed the non-life world. So that, um, the virus is just the virus, you know, as we can, we know now the virus is just doing its thing with bats. It was fine. We have these really serious conversations um, in Cotterbing about, you know, that if you, if you don't allow a space for um, say crabs to be in the mangrove, yeah. Then there'll be no crabs in the mangrove. And if you don't allow a space for bats to be with their viruses, then there will be viruses in places other than bats. And and we don't want the virus with us or we we and I certainly don't want the virus to be killing the people it's mainly killing. I'd rather it like get into some other people's bodies, but but we don't want it to kill anybody, but it is a different logic than it is our friend or it is our enemy. And, and I think that's the, the, it's both that the virus itself is liminal, but that all of these, as your book shows, all of these forms get pulled into this machinery of the political theology of the West in which, um, which, which are you on? Which side are you on? Yeah, they do, and I, I, I just. Oh, sorry. Oh, what no, time? Just, is we? May I just? We have two questions, but I just want oh, to just sorry. add, if you don't mind, this lovely conversation. Mm. Um, um, do, do just one thing. You know, it, the, it is the liminality that Beth you're speaking of. In mm. essence, is reminds us that the modus operandi of the virus, the ontological operational mode, is symbiosis. Right. It is a, a, an essentially sim symbiotic. Um, entity uh, and it's ubiquitous and also transient. It just passes through. Um, before po politics weaponizes it in, in, in the ways that, that both of you discuss so well. So one of the, one of the lessons I think that, it's, that is very clear to, to most people outside of the discourse, regardless, is, is the symbiotic uh, condition, uh, of course, of the human um, with all of these elements, uh, the viral elements. Um, but, but I don't want, I don't, I feel responsible for these questions. Uh, I, but I also, uh, I, I am, if I, if I was not mind, keeping time. Sorry about that. It's okay. No, yeah. it's actually lovely. Uh, and we'll continue in this fashion, but, but I can also, I, wait, 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 stuff is, can just, just, uh, just to throw something on the table that I think is really important in this book. Absolutely. And I happen to agree with it. And therefore I want to emphasize it is that there is a way of beginning with the ontological condition of, of um, symbiosis or, right? Um, but, but what's important about this book and what I think we need to do is never begin with an ontological condition, but rather a historical condition yeah, I agree. in which, yeah, in which certain things were entangled in a way 
that created specific relations of accumulation and dispossession, right? And so I, th and the reason I say that is that, um, you know, I think, you know, some of us are, are too quick to ground our critique in an ontological condition, you know, in biology or physics. And it's like, I don't care what on ontologically is. And I, I come well, from all, philosophy. All I, I really don't care. I mean, no, I, mean all I think it's a jangle. Yeah, but, 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 yeah, yeah, but I don't care if the virus is ontological. I, 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 I'm, I'm not criticizing you. It's just, it's just this thing that I'm really going to just keep yelling about. And what I love about this book is that it starts with the question of the way in which epidemiology can be read in, in, in globalization and post-colonial critique because the epistemology itself is an after effect of colonial conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And, uh, that, I, and I, yeah, think, and honestly, I think it's so straightforward and I think it's hard for people to quite wrap their head because you, you gotta, yeah, sorry, anyways. Mm. But uh, Julie, I wanna come back to, uh, in light of, of this point, uh, um, or to your uh, to your passing comment about poetics, mm. oh. uh, especially in relation to um, to your concern about uh, resistance mm. and uh, or whatever we call that uh, refusal, let's call it that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the flexibility, in fact, that you are trying to you know underline, mm. uh, and it seems to me that that uh, the, the poetic element by and by poetics I, I I'm presume you also mean not just simply writing poetry right but a certain kind of being uh, that we know has been in 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 place um, uh, in uh, you know anti-colonial humanism you know from the beginning you know mm -hmm. Senghor and Cesar Fanon and so on and on to practically every aspect of that uh, and, and its aftermath Sylvia winter most certainly uh, and and more recently, of course, uh, you know, Fred Modern, all, all of black radicalism, really in the 60s, including the Panthers, and then on to even more recently, Jackie Wang and whatever, Zakia Jackson's new book. All of these things, all of these efforts try to, to articulate some sort of refusal that, that also, however, keeps the human in play. Another way of thinking the human away from the colonial uh, uh, humanism, um, you know, the, it, there's a certain kind of poesis that, that is a certain, again, pra practice, not so much a theory, but a way of being, I said. Yeah. So I want to hear you think more about this. Poetry obviously is part of it, but it's not simply attached to language. Um, um, and if it is attached to language, then we have translation. Meaning all I'm saying is that too is global. I mean, it, it's certainly worldwide. It's something that it happens from all kinds of places. It doesn't have a specific place of origin or a, or a, a language that's hegemonic. It is a certain way of being uh, that seems to to um, um, you know to bring together all of these forces that are resisting or refusing the language of science, epidemiology, and and weaponizing it, and and of course politics and power that you guys have been discussing mm -hmm. so well. So I want to hear you just kind of riff a bit on that. I'm curious to see how what you're thinking. I mean, I simultaneously want to riff and I want to be super precise. Like in the, I'm in a mood of like, I'm in a mood of like, we create the chants an hour and a half ago on the street in live space on a day when something happens, we negotiate. Are we saying fuck the NYPD today? Or is today not the day for that? Is this not the block for that? Like. Mm -hmm. Is, does this precinct need to hear that message from this group of people? Like that negotiation is a matter of language, but it's also a matter of gesture. <laughs> it's a matter of yeah. history, it's a matter of rhythm. And I think I, I, you know, I'm I'm not ever going to talk about poetry without talking about language and the law and language and history. I'm never gonna talk about poetry without talking about state-sponsored prose. It's one of the reasons why it really mattered to me to read the 9-11 Commission Report as a literary document. Mm. Um, right. So, so right. the poesis of anti-colonialism is ongoing. It's multi it's multi-generic um, and it's in constant translation. And, you know, I don't, I, 
I don't write about global phenomena in certain kinds of ways for a reason, because I think that I think kind of to Beth's earlier point, like I did for many years get really wrapped up in the in the kind of deterritorialized and dehistoricized um, theories of the virus that were everywhere. Beth, you remember yeah. this. You also are critiquing them yeah. and they don't get you anywhere. <laughs> they're, they're slippery, lubed up Teflon concepts that don't produce any historical or political friction. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like the, the very specific contexts in which um, the, the uses of epidemiological method and study and language are both mm -hmm. um, turned toward liberation or critiqued, it's those spaces of kind of minor poetics. I mean, Beth, when you asked me what's, yeah. what was like surprising, kind of like those 19th century doctors. Like the, I, we have to think of those spaces as poetic spaces as well, yeah. mostly because there's nothing happening unless there's a desire and a commitment to inventing a new world. Well, and poesis, you know, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Just poesis, I was just gonna say poesis in that fundamental etymological sense as a making um, is, is a kind of, uh, it's an act of like social transformation. Um, yeah, that's, that's, exactly, that's where I was, you know, was exactly just, how I meant it. So okay. thank you. Yes. Go ahead, yeah. Beth. Sorry. No, 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 no. I just get too excited. Um, um, you know, that's why, like, I, I, look, I was teaching Guha and Bakhtin and Voloshinov just the last couple of classes that I was teaching the seminar, of course. And, you know, there's some, you know, there's some, I'm trying to teach technical stuff and like the from which and why this one drifted over to language has an abstract, you know, blah, blah. But one of the things that I really loved about the book and, and of course about Guha's early attempts to, to do an archeology span of voices mm -hmm. relates to, I think, how you're thinking about poesis because for someone like me, I very much think, you know, deeply as a subject, all, all my voices, all my, all my, all my words are, are indirect discourse. It's my, my way of speaking, my minor poetics, which is a, it's an ear jarring poetics, <laughs> is the culmination of a history of, of direct and indirect citation of worlds that have meaning. Right? And Part I think what you do in the book with real care and what we try and do when we're in the street with real care and what we try and do in whatever kind of coalitions or collectives we're in with real care is to try and hear that history of 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 citation of 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 someone else's poetics and and how we're captured by it and how we try and capture others for good or bad. And, and that is a, being able to hear those submerged citations, right? There's no quotation marks anymore. Like when I say, let's start class or let's start the seminar, that's a history of teachers who have said that. And that's, I know, and those doctors that you're reading is this, history of, of poetics that they put in or prose that they put into a poetics or in a minor sense that closes the text and makes it compelling. And how do we hear that rich social world? How do we do that methodologically? And I, I was really moved because I think the book really pushes toward that, you know, on top of the formal poetics and on top of other kinds of police. I love that we've ended in this very like um, spiritual place about the book because it does like in in the you know in the minimophidia of like footnotes and whatever and specifics of the disease that we've needed to talk about for a year it has been I mean what I most hoped for the book was that it was exactly that kind of channeling yeah. like mm. that that kind of I don't know now now I'm feeling very cheesy but like I was a singer you know you that you're you yeah. you're taught oh, yeah. to, and, and as poets yeah. you're also taught to think of yourself as a vessel and that citational practice 
Um, I mean, especially as an Urdu poet, you're supposed to be thinking of, your, of yourself only as a vessel of God, right? How dare you think anything else? And there's something in scholarly practice that is like that too. There's something in teaching that is like that too. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, to the practical point that you were asking earlier, I've been, I watched Catherine McKittrick talk last night and I've been reading oh. Dear Science um, mm -hmm. in which she really does an amazing um, kind of revival or revision of citational politics and really critique Sara Ahmed's kind of um, insistence on certain citational practices um, as, I just want to keep it very simple, but like upholding like women scholars and women of color and whatever. And I think there's something so just fabulous about the way McKittrick critiques that identity politics version of citational practice and instead is moving toward what I would call something like a more communal ownership. I've weirdly been thinking about this because I was writing about anthropology in that horror movie that came out two summers ago called Midsummer. Beth, have you oh, seen it? Oh, I never it? saw it. I never saw it. Well, it has an anthropology sub. I know, I know, so I know. I just of, never saw it. Yeah, I just never saw it. Yeah. But like the ownership of ideas is another way of talking yeah. about the, yeah. the craziness of what we've inherited, um, yeah. like the virus doesn't, I, we do need to wrap it up, but this conversation got so conceptual so fast. I've like forgot <laughs> to say that the virus. I, I have a question to ask from a person who is actually, which is actually really concrete and historical. So. Oh, okay. Well, we can do it. At which point I yeah. certainly won't be able to answer it. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I'm but, sure you will. But I'm Julia. I'm thinking, of course, of you know the citational practice of someone like like Fez, let's say. Oh yeah. Okay? yeah. I mean, which is of course mm -hmm. always, uh, you know, it, yes, of course, the forms are uh, the old Islamic poetic forms, but the way that they're cited, completely, mm -hmm. uh, right. Well, I should send it to you, Stathis. I have a poem called "Reading Namaz with Fez," which uh, cites excellent. Fez. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we have to shut up so we can uh, so people can have their question that uh, answered. Uh, the, the, there's a question here that is definitely concrete uh, by Basuli Dev. Uh, have you found any 19th century archival sources on the Asiatic cholera epidemic from an anti-colonial viewpoint? Are there any cultural production songs, images? Well, there we go again. That write or speak back to the empire. Mm. Basuli, I kind of counter politics. Go ahead. Sorry. I totally love this question, and yes, um, tons. Uh, so it there. So I would divide my way of talking about this into kind of four archives. Um, there's the there's the the where I looked in the French Empire and the British Empire, and in each of those two scenes, I would say um, you get um, anti-colonial medical viewpoints, both from white colonial doctors and from local trainees. So. Um, so uh, really like interesting medical corps that was trained by British doctors, but then sent into the field as um, South Asian practitioners, what we would call now something more like nurse practitioners or something mm -hmm. like that, um, primary care takers. Um, and then you also see it, uh, you, you also see in both of those two scenes um, from the communities that are getting the sickest. So like what we would talk about today in terms of um, resistance or protest to um, the racialization of COVID-19 in the United States. Um, a couple of things that come immediately to mind are back to those nice 19th century doctors. Um, but there was, you can see the record of it really beautifully in the um, report on the 1850 uh, International Sanitary Conference that took place in Constantinople where there were medical people and, and scientists from all over the colonial world at, who were talking about, who kind of knew at that point in 1850 that global trade was going to need to get shut down. And so there was a real strong, like lefty resistance to empire on the basis or in, in service of public health. Right. Um, and that's like a place where the resistance exists that you wouldn't exactly see it or know, know to look for it. Syed Ahmed Khan's writing on the Indian mutiny is another place that I would point you to. Um, he was what we call an Urdu Chamcha. So he like absolutely was a defender of the empire. He loved the British. But that essay that he wrote about the causes of the Indian rebellion, um, it, which, he pub which he wrote in initially in Urdu and was published in translation immediately is another place that I would suggest an anti-colonial um, viewpoint on the mutiny as a kind of extension or metaphor um, of the cholera epidemic. Um, the development of local idols and gods is another, uh, another place to look. David Arnold writes about this a little bit um, in 
uh, in his big book on colonialism and cholera in India. But yeah, it's a, it's um it's an incredibly rich set of texts, and then there are parallel uh, things on the on the francophone side as well, both in the nineteenth century context and then kind of resurging in the in the Camus um, Algeria independence era of the forties to the sixties. So, uh, so the other, there are a couple of comments uh, more than questions, but they are definitely in conversation with uh, what you guys have been talking about. Um, one is a comment about uh, about the synergistic pandemic. Uh, that's a direct quotation uh, of um, tuberculosis in South Africa, uh, which uh, came through, of course, uh, uh, slavery and, col the, and uh, colonialism in South Africa, but uh, now um, and and ended up replacing the indigenous type subtypes of tuberculosis. Uh, and now wild elephants, I'm reading now, uh, uh, wild elephants in Africa suffer from human tuberculosis that comes from the new world and from Europe. So, so that is a, a kind of an interesting and perhaps even better way to think of this symbiotic as something that is in fact synergistic. So I'd like the, the terms to kind of resonate. Uh, and then um, another comment you can talk about, we only have five minutes so, and, and, and Julie, you're just going to respond to these comments. They're not quite questions. Uh, the other one is about the conversation uh, be, uh, re regarding ontology and epistemology um, that uh, uh, Bazuli is writing again. Um, I'm thinking about Anna Ching's ethnographic account of the Machutaki mushroom's ability to assert its life in human disturbed forest ecologies of the Northern hemisphere through symbiotic survival of certain species of pines. So uh, can we say that uh, the virus is emblematic of a symbiotic relationship or um, are we thinking, a, a, you know, in terms of how um, um, or, or how would this work with the empire's epistemological use of the virus? So this is really a response to that kind of conversation. I, f I feel like I've heard Beth talking about that book recently too, in regard to this um, uh, to this question of the virus. There goes the duck. <laughs> That's called bird flu, Beth. Be careful. <laughs> My real life, just like all I do is throw that duck. I sit here and throw that duck. Um, so, um, well, any last comments for the, for, from both of you? Well, I just thoroughly enjoyed this. Honestly, I love the book. People go out and buy the book there. Yes. Oh, no, seriously. <laughs> I I hope you I hope you enjoyed. I just thought it was a great book and an even better conversation. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for doing it. Um, and I hope that uh, oh I forgot to say this, which I normally say. Anybody who's here, especially if you're a graduate student and you have questions, um, please find me. Uh -huh. I'm easy to Google, and you can find me on Twitter. And I really um like there's no there's no especially practical or process question that i won't um answer for for grad students out there who are finishing dissertations or thinking about first books bravo so before we close and 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 uh, applaud our, our two guests i just wanted to uh remind everyone who's listening that uh, we're resuming these series on the 27th um by uh, same time 6 p.m uh, the title of, the, of that uh, panel is Homesick, Reimagining Indoor-Outdoor Space in the Pandemic. Uh, so please put in your calendar. And again, uh, Anjuli and Beth, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic uh, conversation and everyone else for watching. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Congratulations, Anjuli, for your book. Yeah. Thanks.